Hello and welcome to the latest webinar in the Elemental Talks programme. Our topic today, Home Electrical Infrastructure of the Future, How Net Zero is Changing the Electrical Foundations in Our Homes. This is the sixth session in our Zero Carbon Homes series broadcast throughout this month, partnership with BEMA, UK Trade Association for Manufacturers and Providers of Energy Infrastructure Technologies and Systems. Your chair for the next 60 minutes, my name is Jim McClelland. I'm founder and editor of Sust Meme, home to both the magazine and the top 500 rankings. Joining me on the panel this afternoon are Martin Allen, Technical Director, Electrical Safety First, ESF, Kieran White, Category Marketing Manager, Schneider Electric, Peter White, DSO Development Engineer at Western Power Distribution, and Nick Haler, Head of Building Electrical Systems at BEMA. It is all live, as you will see, with Q&A to finish. So pop your questions in the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen, probably the clues in the name. You pose them, I'll ask them, they'll answer them. So a little bit about Elemental before we start. This webinar forms part of a program of talks hosted and produced by Elemental, elementalexpo.com. It's the online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air, and energy, vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. You'll find the full diary of events both on the website and on the Elemental Crowdcast page where you registered and came in. Range of upcoming webinars, including one final session tomorrow in the Zero Carbon Home series with Beamer, which is all supported by Glenn Dimplex, Drayton Controls, Valen UK, Lucy Electric, Schneider Electric, and AD. Thank you very much. You'll also find the back catalog, broad range of topics, every webinar so far over the last couple of weeks in the Beamer series. They're all available on demand. They're all free to access. So loads of infotainment as well as news and longer articles. Brief intro, topic today, home electrical infrastructure of the future. We're gonna be exploring the changing electrical foundations in our residential properties. We'll be discussing how the UK government commitment to achieving net zero by 2050 may impact not just our homes in the future, but of course where we live now, literally too. So the panel will highlight key aspects of the current situation, the issues surrounding it, what can be done to overcome some of these challenges, what needs to be in place to make it happen, and who stands to benefit from the change. But in particular, our experts are gonna offer a deep dive into three areas, mandatory electrical safety inspections, three-phase supply to homes, plus the domestic energy center. Our talk today is drawing on the eponymous paper from BEMA, Home Electrical Infrastructure of the Future, How Net Zero is Changing the Electrical Foundations in Our Homes. And you'll see the link already in the chat, so you can click and read it in full and look at the numbers and the outputs there. Today's session, as I said, it's the sixth. It's the penultimate in our Super 7 on Zero Carbon Homes, the Beamer and Elemental series of talks on the drive to retrofit by 2050, low carbon heating, net zero targets. As I've said almost every session, the reality is we face a big, big delivery challenge. And these talks debate the options for our sector as we harness opportunities to combine emission cuts with better home health, well-being, and system upgrades. So enough from me, let the talks begin. So. As we start to explore home electrical infrastructure future, I'd like to begin by asking our panel to introduce themselves, share some opening insights. It'll be around the paper, the three deep dive topics, plus the wider market in general. So to kick us off, Nick, the Beamer paper discusses how the UK government net zero 2050 commitment may impact homes now and in the future. Can you share for us, please, what are the key takeaways? Good afternoon and uh, to everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar. So just a quick introduction from me and on the white paper. So I'm Nick Haler and I work for BEMA as their Head of Electrical uh, buildings, Building Electrical Systems. The UK has been at the forefront of global action to tackle climate change and has led the way by decarbonising its economy faster than any other G7 country. In 2019, the UK became the world's first major economy to adopt a legally binding target to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. The costs and benefits from the transition to a net zero economy will pass through households, directly as bill payers, motorists or homeowners, and indirectly as consumers, employees, business owners or taxpayers. However, the transition will be dynamic and the costs and benefits will not fall evenly across households. As the UK continues to decarbonise, it will be important to take account of the factors that influence the distribution of costs and benefits. Globally, we are in need of low carbon technologies to achieve our targets. 
Low carbon technologies refer to all measures and methods designed to reduce the use of fossil fuels such as oil, coal and gas by replacing them with new renewables. Low carbon technologies are an integral part of the energy transition. Today, we're going to discuss three enablers for net zero targets to be met for our domestic properties. These are mandatory electrical safety inspections, three phase supply and the domestic energy center. So we're going to be covering the types of questions. We highlight the current situation, the issues surrounding the current situation, what could be done to overcome these issues that needs to be in place when this to make this happen and who benefits. Thank you very much, Nick. So we're already looking at a dynamic transition and, as you've said, an uneven cost benefit allocation. And we'll get into some of those conflicts and some of those issues as we get along. But starting then with the first of the three enablers in our deep dive, if you like, next. Martin, if I could come to you. So mandatory electrical safety inspections, how important are they for obviously making sure homes are ready for the future and for reducing fire risk? Martin, please. Thanks, Jim, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be part, part of this panel today. Uh, as you'll see referenced in the Beamer paper, there's a link to, to a paper we published only a couple of weeks ago about electrical safety in the net zero home. And, you know, when we've been looking at this for quite some time now, that, that safety must be at the heart as we, as we transition to net zero. And it's interesting that government's heating and building strategy was published only last week. And, you know, safety was was silent in that paper, and as has been the case in all the other, other government papers. There may be a couple of mentions related to hydrogen, but nothing relating to the safety of electricity. And clearly, electricity is going to be the key energy source as we transition to, to net zero. Much more about electrification in the way we heat our homes. You know, we've got, got heat pumps coming coming through through the door in, in, in large volumes. You know, you've got battery storage systems, the way we're actually moving around through electric vehicles connected home connected technology all powered by electricity so you know mains electricity it's not always a it's a wonderful thing but it comes with with serious safety concerns as well but clearly we need to make sure that our, our new housing stock takes account of all the new technologies to make them net zero as quickly as possible uh, and, and and as much as possible you know some of the new builds are perhaps not including some of the technologies we'd like to see them uh, doing so but the, by far the biggest challenge, I think we all agree, is what do we do with the existing housing stock? I'm sure others will pick up on it as well. In the UK, we do have you know, the, the oldest housing stock in the EU, arguably in the world. You know, Wales is the oldest and Northern Ireland is, is, is the newest. But we've got a, quite a significant old housing stock. And, and that, that presents you know, challenges in terms of whether our existing homes are able to cope with the new technologies we're trying to install in those, in those properties. You know, without certainly without additional significant investment that's needed. Uh, you know, we could have new consumers required, new wiring, uh, even the cables actually down, down the roads and the streets, you know, supplying. So preparedness is going to be a thing. You know, how big is the challenge in terms of being prepared for this huge transition challenge that we've got? And so we're, that's going to come from data primarily. So, you know, where are we going to get that from? We need to make sure that we can make use of all the, the data sources that we're able to get access to, whether that's the condition, surveys that there's one that runs in England, one in Scotland and the same in Wales and even in Northern Ireland. But also we look at the safety of, of homes in general. And, you know, in, in the UK, we've got a fragmented system uh, across all the UK nations. It's essentially a, a postcode and, and tenure lottery. You know, we've got legislation requiring five yearly uh, electrical safety checks in Scotland for both the private sector and the social rented sector. England came over the line with the private rented sector legislation uh, fully into effect April of this year, which was great. We still haven't got there with the social rented sector. And Wales and Northern Ireland are still in that period of deciding what to do in legislation. We know it's been developed, but it's not over the line yet. And what we believe, and we called out in our paper, is that there should be equality across all tenures, you know, certainly for, for rented accommodation. And, you know, for us, we think that is five yearly electrical safety checks. That's periodic inspection and testing to, to, to people on the call. You know, so you've got electrical installation condition reports that give you that, that sort of bill of health, a bit like the MOT for the car, just so we know what, what the, the safety and condition of the installations are in, in, in those properties. 
we believe you also should consider the owner-occupied sector, particularly in high-risk buildings such as high-rise for the obvious shared risk that exists yeah. in, those, in those types of properties. But essentially, having a, an EICR program you know, will give us fantastic information to help with that preparedness to feed into transition plans. Uh, it's just going to be so valuable as well, of course, as making sure that people can live in their homes, well, in a safer home. So that's why we believe mandatory checks are are, are essential to, to feed into the Net Zero programme. And perhaps the last thing I should finish off, of course, not everybody can do them. If you're having the, those inspection and tests need to be done by a competent yeah. person, such as a registered electrician. Excellent. Thank you, Martin. So plenty of good issues in play there. As you said, safety should be at the heart of this transition, but often actually it seems to go missing in the debate or it's silent, shall we say. We're already talking about having the oldest living stock. And in a sense, we talk about the transition being a journey and the targets being the destination. But if we're honest, of course, to make that journey, we never choose to start from where we are on the map. But it is where we are. We are starting with the stock we've got. And a lot of the challenges are, as you implied, the inconsistencies, that postcode lottery element, the, the fact there isn't a one size fits all. There's a lot of interpretation and a lot of uneven distribution, but it's all about preparedness and a good call for mandatory checks with, of course, the skills alongside necessary to do those. So in terms of that existing stock discussion, then Peter, if I come to you now, so we have rapid charging infrastructure for electric vehicles being rolled out to think about. We have heat pumps, of course, potentially 600,000 a year, potentially, I'd say. So why is three-phase supply not just a matter for new build, that tiny percentage, but for this existing stock too? Well, I could be flippant and say not all charges are going to be rapid because <laughs> um, fundamentally you've got four places you can charge. Um, about 60% of us have got off-street parking, so they'll charge at home. Then there's charging at work, destination charging, and en route charging. And the rapid chargers fall into the en route charging, which will be project rapid um, that owes ever uh, rolling out across the motorway services in England. Um, the chargers at the home are going to be the 7.4 kilowatt fast chargers. So read into that uh, as fast charging, then yes, um, I personally believe that three phase is necessary. Um, picking up um, what um, Martin said, if you look, this, um, the Center for Aging Better says that only 7% of our housing stock in Britain is post 2000. And that's quite critical because that's when you started getting insulation standards, et cetera, coming in. And if we start decarbonizing transport and heating, you're adding quite a sizable load um, and work the Electricity Networks Association have done shows the LV load could increase by as much as 40%. Projects uh, WPD have carried out, um, primarily Electric Nation. If you're an average mileage driver, so somebody who does about 8,000 miles a year, and you do it in a battery electric vehicle, you're going to double the electricity consumption that your house will have. So if, for example, you've got a gas-fired four-bedroom detached house, your after-diversity maximum demand would be sort of 2 kVA. If you had this uh, battery electric vehicle and you did about 8,000 miles a year, your demand would now go up to 4 kVA. So currently, everything outside of WPD land is single phase. So you, you're putting 32 amps on one phase. So the more load you've got on your service cable, you start getting losses in the service cable. If you haven't got um, 
the two adjacent houses so that you've got red L1, L2, L3 loaded up with 32 amps. You then get out of balance in the main cable and in the transformer. And all these losses have to be paid for. And as a consequence, every bill payer, electricity bill payer, pays a percentage for those losses. If you had a three-phase car charger, then having one switched off, you still got a balanced load because the load is split over red L1, L2, L3. So again, if you look at um, heat pumps, because we've got the oldest housing stock and people haven't been uh, doing a fabric first approach, it's like going off and doing your weekly shop, opening the fridge to put all your food in and walking out the kitchen, leaving the, the fridge door open and wondering why the, the food goes off. Because a heat pump is a fridge in reverse. You're moving heat from one zone to another zone. That's how a heat pump works. And let's just take a nine kilowatt heat pump because then my maths can cope with it. If, you, if you've got single phase, that's nine kilowatts on one phase. So again, go back to the three adjacent houses, L1, L2, L3. If one of those houses has got a heat pump off, that's nine kilowatts of difference between, um, say, L1's off. You've got nine kilowatts difference between L1, L2, and L3. So those losses are huge. If you had three phase going into the house and a three phase heat pump, you've now got three kilowatts per phase. The load in your cables drop down, so you're not working the cable as hard. So the losses in the cable aren't there. Because there's no out of balance in the main, you've not got uh, losses in the main or in the transformer. So there's a massive saving for UK PLC. And if we can cut losses, that means we've got more load to do other things with. So it's a win-win situation for everybody. And new build is easy. If you look at retrofitting um, housing association, or in old terms, the old council estates, that's easy as well because it's done on a street by street basis so if the host dno has got to dig up the street that street's chaos anyway you're just adding a little bit more chaos to um the environment now i'm, I'm trying to be logical about this um where if you look at the owner op occupier situation it then becomes uh quite difficult to um, deal with and because it's so disparate you, you can't work on a feeder at a time etc etc so th there's a, a raft of ways uh, that we've got to try and address it which becomes more complex and then if you go back to retrofitting because we're rolling out three phase <clears throat> with it all new build or service alterations for free now, um, then any loop service we change for free and you get a three-phase cable, a three-phase uh, box and a three-phase cutout. It's up to the house owner whether they want to make use of it. But we're future-proofing because the service cable is a radial feed and it's the smallest cable on the network and every time you pick up a shovel and put it in the ground you've probably added two zeros to the number you first thought of so if we can utilize an open trench dropping in a three-phase cable the uplift in cost is minuscule compared to the long-term benefits um, so those are some of the thoughts on why it should go three phase. Excellent. And um, a yeah, really detailed analysis and um, bringing out some of the complexity. And this is why 
were desperate for a strategic coordinated approach, as you say, to bring together the fast charging, not rapid, but the fast charging future proofing, if you like, but also the fabric first scenario. So we're not just pouring heat into a leaky building effectively. You know, so there are many, many considerations within this and we'll maybe come later in this discussion on to exactly whose job it's going to be to lead on some of these issues but in the first round here of these questions so if i'm i'm coming to you now kieran renewable generation battery storage ev charging smart meters automation talk us through the how and why consumer units need to be upgraded to what we're called a domestic energy center but, um, thanks very much for inviting me today, by the way. Um, if you think about 15 years ago, the thought of having a photovoltaic solar panel system in a home would probably be unheard of in the UK, maybe a little bit morbid or 15 years. But what's as, what that has introduced is a second source of supply where historically we've just had a single support, um, single supply from the grid, from the likes of Peter there, WPD. So we have uh, another source of supply. We have on-site generation by... Um, consumers who are now called prosumers because they're now mm -hmm. producing their own energy and so we need to be able to control understand where this energy is being used control where it's coming from and make a informed decision of where best to utilize that energy so if you imagine um you know pre-covid we're all out at work during the day or vast majority of the uk so the solar panels are generating energy um the you know the homeowner will decide whether to export the energy back onto the grid whether to consume it whether to store it locally in a battery storage maybe in the ev car maybe even charge a tank of hot water because it's generally during the day that you know that we have the off-peak section so we can utilize um the off-peak tariffs to charge our devices and then when it goes into the peak so it's, um the peak period in the evenings then we have the spare capacity to then to draw off these sources. Now, all these, um, so whether you're talking about heat pump control, whether you're talking about PV, whether you're talking about battery storage or even using your car storage or, or charging your car, um, charging your electric car, um, that's gonna need some kind of technology to, to aggregate all those signals in and make the best decision of where that energy is, is put. So, so moving forward, to, to, to help the, um, the government meet the net zero uh, target of 2050, level C, then yes, we need obviously look at the fabric as it's already been mentioned, but we need to make best use and more efficient use of the available energy we have. Mm -hmm. And as, as Peter has said, you know, with the car chargers, um, you know, that's gonna put a massive load onto the system. Um, there's company, yeah, and, and I'm sure we'll discuss later, the, the infrastructure challenges that's gonna pose, but, just the the ev charging and the, the you know the, the the heating system going on the electric system that is just going to you know um increase the amount of the demand on the system interestingly enough this morning i was talking to electricians and they were talking about a six, uh, 12 kilowatt electric boiler being put into a property so that's the kind of loadings i mean 15 years ago we're looking at the largest load in the house maybe the shower you know going to a 10 and a half kilowatt shower maybe induction hub but now it's going more ev and more on the heating side so moving forward the smart technologies um it's going to play a key role to understand where the energy is being used when we're using it and then also to be able to push that information back demand side response back to the uh, dno to, to give them an idea of what our demand response or demand requirements are excellent thank you kieran so we're already talking about prosumers we're looking at peak periods and we're looking very much optimizing this energy usage and so as we then move into the second round of questions, I'd encourage your audience to pop your questions in the ask a question box at the bottom. You type them in there and I'll ask them as we come round to that in the latter part of the session. But now we've looked at some of the problems and there are plenty of them and the challenges and the hurdles, the obstacles. But I'd now like to invite the panel to think positive. Let's look at successful approaches to home electrical infrastructure of the future. Let's put on our rose tinted spectacles for a bit of future gazing and imagine we are going to transform the role of residential in the climate agenda. We are going to overcome some of these. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is think forward, fast forward five to 10 years. So five or 10 years, we've, we've had the investment, we've had the support, we've had the backing. I know that's fanciful, but it's going well. If, if we were doing what we hope to be doing in five or 10 years time, my first question is, Give me an idea. What does the landscape look like then for electricity 
in the UK? Where do you see us getting to in five or ten years? Who'd, who'd like to get out their crystal ball first? Peter? I'm, I'm quite um, positive about what's going to happen in the short term because I recently went on to a webinar where um, the lady who was chairing our session actually heads up the Green Finance um, Institute. And if, if you've been following the media, they've, last week they issued some reports on how they're going to uh, see this whole process going forward. And they're looking at the fabric of the building and how the owner occupier can draw down green finance and they want to tie it into the mortgage, etc. So that if the owner occupiers uh, been proactive, they can um, make savings for the work they've done going forward. So I think that's a very positive uh, step. And I, I think it will really help matters no end because, as I said, we've got to tackle the fabric of the building first mm -hmm. before we move on. The other thing that I think is essential, uh, picking up on Kieran's point, is when you add the complete suite of low carbon tech, I think it's essential that each of those disparate devices is tied into a program logic controller or energy management system, which ties them all together so you don't get them fighting against each other because if, you, if you're not a nerd and you don't set them up properly, then they could lead you into fuel poverty by increased uh, bills. Where if, if you've got this program logic controller that's uh, got AI in it, artificial intelligence, where it's analyzing how you live your life and looking to minimize your fuel bills, then I can see the bills actually coming down. And because you've, you've got your uh, PV, it feeds your battery storage, so you're not using expensive electricity between 5 and 10 at night. Um, and it generally just manages that. And um, the Welsh Government, I would say, are probably two years ahead of England in this respect because they're busy with optimized retrofit program, ORP, and they're actually looking at how they can create um, a building passport to get to net zero. And um, it includes putting on the complete suite of LCTs, having this program logic controller, which is all integrated into a distribution board, et cetera, et cetera, and allows everything to work in harmony and ultimately bring the bills to uh, the house owner down. Excellent. Nice bit of future gazing and a good shout out for Wales, which is very progressive on quite a lot of climate mm. and sustainability issues from a policy and a legislation uh, point of view. Also very interesting about the green finance. We hear a lot about the so-called wall of money that's available for low tech uh, low carbon, I should say, innovation. Uh, and alongside that is also increasingly this kind of green personal finance and mortgage finance and lending. So we could do separate sessions on exactly how the money is going to fit together to deliver things at both sides of the counter, if you like. Martin, if I could ask you then, if you're thinking ahead five or 10 years, are the kinds of things like the mandatory uh, checks, is that just going to be the new normal, ideally, in your, your utopia five, ten years down the line? Where, where might safety sit? Will it be so so business as usual that we don't even think about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that we will get the legislation for both the private rented sector and social rented sector for all four nations. I'm quite, quite positive about that. I think common sense will prevail. There's certainly <laughs> additional challenges in the social rented sector than there are in the private sector, but nevertheless, it's achievable if we've got the will for change. But the thing that sort of I, I'm, I'm hoping we get there in sort of five to 10 years is a clear program to get all these additional installers in place. We talk about the technology, we talk about the size of the challenge, but 
where the heck are we going to get these people from? And, yeah, yeah. you know, you talk to many organizations and the age profile of people working for them is, is the wrong side of, of 50. You know, I'm yeah, still yeah. in that, in that camp. And I don't think we talk about just upskilling the existing workforce. We've got to get new people into the industry. We've got to get new people. So that's into schools. We need to make it turning from a job into a profession. Mm -hmm. We need to make it attractive. It's a sustainable, well-paid sort of profession to go into. But I think we really need to go into the early years of schools just to start those building blocks to educate them on energy efficiency, but also get their attention and move into getting people to installing things and maintaining them. You know, it's not just about installation, it's about maintaining them thereafter. But that is the, for me, second to the financials conversation, which is clearly outside of my, my sort of remit, but the number of people, where the heck are we going to get them from? And so as many, you know, starting in the schools, providing incentives to businesses, removing any barriers. You know, so we've got an infrastructure of getting people through the doors out into the installer base so that they can install this equipment safely. Because my, my concern is that without that installer base, competent installer base, then consumers all choose to do alternatives. You know, the consequences, the negative side. So people will be using people who are perhaps not competent or worse still having to go themselves. You know, that's something we've seen. Yeah. And other things so for me we've got to get the installer base right and i hope that we can get that in place in the next five to ten years so serious program in place yeah that's a very good point we have a the webinar the last in the series tomorrow is on skills and i know we talk about the skills gap and the green skills and jobs potential but as soon as you track back from some of those enormous numbers for heat pumps etc i know peter could tell us about this as soon as you track back in terms of the number of bodies on board to deliver any of this change the math starts to fall apart very quickly at present. And I think we need to be realistic that the sector has to compete in an open market for talent. It has to steal and win talent from other sectors, including tech. You know, as you say, there's, there's, a, there's a hard core of personnel at present who are maybe the older generation and aren't going to be around forever. And we need to have a more diverse and inclusive workforce and attract an awful lot of younger people into it. So there are some real challenges. So Nick, I saw you nodding about some of the things you've heard already in terms of your, your, your wishful thinking five or 10 years down the line, what sort of things might you hope we're seeing if things have gone well? Well, I just um, following on from where Martin's saying about and the skill gap, the STEM subjects, uh, in mm -hmm. primary, secondary school are key. Um, they've got to understand how these subjects affect their future, trying to encourage the younger generation to go into engineering, electrical engineering, heating, in, um, heating engineering and so on. That skill gap is massive. You talked about the 600,000 uh, heat pumps. Uh, how they're going to install those at the moment well, it just wouldn't happen. Um, so that, that's a key subject to me. But it's got to be competent, as Martin said as well. That, that's a key factor. Going in to do a, a six-week course is not going to be enough. Yeah. You know, apprentices, served time, apprentices and such like are going to be key to drive that forward. That also links on to the domestic energy centre for me. A big part of the domestic energy centre is safety. Kieran talked about all these technologies coming together in one area within your home. You know, I've just had a solar install in my home and so there's another consumer unit put in. There's more cables, there's more isolators. Mm -hmm. You know, for myself, I know what I'm looking at, but for, for, for the home general homeowner, well, if they need to isolate something themselves, or, you know, they're going to be bamboozled by this massive equipment in front of them. Having a centralised ginormous consumer unit, whatever we want to look at it, with all this technology, a single way to isolate everything, which is easy for the homeowner, and for those people that are testing, inspecting those homes as well is essential. So there's a lot of work to be done. A lot of our members are working on this type of technology already. We have groups that focus on the domestic energy center. So our members uh, talk about these subjects, they're, they're, they're sharing ideas, developing these ideas. So there's a lot going on in the background. Um, but a lot of it boils down to two key factors. Well, there's the money as well, but it is safety for me and the training, the skills gap as well. Excellent, safety and training. Kieran, if I could come to you, and there's a, there a second follow-on question I wanted to ask as well. But I'm asking about your five or 10 year uh, wishful thinking vision, but also <clears> I wanted <throat> to ask really about design, engineering products, 
innovation how is innovation going to involve so if you if you could give me a little picture of where you see it in five or ten years but also if you could give me a flavor of where you think innovation exciting innovation might be a bit of a game changer for us so so definitely um innovation as in technology so generally we see technology is developed for the commercial industrial environment and has as that becomes more popular we then see it feeding down in the residential and moving forward we look to to embrace um, that move so if you think of the commercial environment we have BEM systems building energy management systems where we're monitoring the the outside air temperature turning the heating on you know compensating our outside air monitoring co2 monitoring um, various different conditions um and and, and as um as peter said you know the plc or a home energy center that will be that the hub that will be the the analytical uh, uh brain if you like of the home which will take all these um signals in and make informed decisions so you know you won't put the heating on i mean in extreme condition you could say well we'll have door contacts on the doors so we shouldn't turn the heating on unless the doors are closed because it's just inefficient um we can have sensors monitoring um, damp mold so but looking at health of buildings mm -hmm. moving forward the health of people but in five ten years time i'd like to see i mean we're all addicted to our phones these days so on your laptop on your phone on your tablet you'll have a dashboard which will give you a health status of your home so you'll have um yeah uh, heating's on batteries charge at 75 percent currently the energy we're generating for free through the uh, pvs is charging the car so we'll have this real-time kind of almost tangible information that people can act on so if you think about the the um, smart meter rollout and we can argue whether that has been as successful as we'd hoped but what that has done for people who have taken it up has, has given them visibility of well, actually every time i turn the kettle on that little digit goes a bit faster so it makes them you know it gives them an idea of what they're using where they're using so moving forward um technology advances you know we'll have like you know in the commercial environment um we have a system where we can monitor line level consumption so by understanding what we use on certain circuits again that's all going to feed the more information we have to feed in mm -hmm. to that um, home energy system um that will make the best informed decisions of where and how and when we use that energy moving forward so i'm very excited that you know as a bit of a techie geek as well that we'll have <laughs> you know you'll, you'll have a, a health passport you know and and feeding into the um electrical um surveys martin was talking about the eirc i knew him as um what did i know them as uh, what was the old term for them martin uh, periodic inspection that's how long I've <laughs> there we go eirc e e e e <laughs> so um but you know you, you think how many homeowners they they, they probably know to get their the boiler checked every year but because it's out of sight out of mind they probably don't even consider their electrical system which you know it, it, which mm -hmm. has potentially you know has a lot more potential maybe that they could do harm and you know tied in what nick said about the training we definitely need people on board when I did my apprenticeship 30 years ago, 21 electrical apprentices for the one company were taken on in Birmingham. And we've never seen that intake since. Um, there is a raft of, um, you know, once you have the base skill of electrician, you know, you basically never be out of work because you can migrate those skill sets to, to several different, and you know, whether you want to go telecoms, whether you want to go heat pump installation. So it's, it's a very um, exciting place for, um, for both technology and for young people who want to come into the industry because the, literally the world is their oyster moment. We have 29, circa 29 million homes to get up to net zero level yep. C in 29 years. That's a million homes a year. So, you know, that's set yep. the bar quite high. So these kind of discussions and this, you know, elevating these kind of issues is certainly going to go places to try and um, to get this, um, accelerate this timetable moving forward. Yeah, very, very nice point there about the, the scale of the opportunity is exciting. I know it's daunting, but it is also exciting. And of course, where there's that level of opportunity, there is also business to be won. Let's not be squeamish about this. You know, there's opportunity for manufacturers and organizations, companies. Um, I have a question that's come up with. It's a, it's a question. It's almost a provocation, if you like, from Mark Han. And I'm going to throw it straight back to Nick, actually, because I think he's picking up on some of what you said there. So. Uh, Mark says, if we're talking so much about a desperate need for skilled people, as all the panel have been saying, to install new technologies, etc., are we going off in the wrong direction from the outset? Surely we must start with creating technology and systems that don't require that level of skill. So what he's effectively saying is, can't we make it easier? Aren't we making it hard for ourselves with that kind of skill level? 
what, what, how do you respond to that? It's a nice prov provocative question to start with for you there, Nick. So yeah, um, thanks very what, much. What... <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <Good> <laughs> yeah. uh, there's two two skill sets. Um, you've got the installation and maintenance skill set, and we know that you, it takes time to develop those skills. This isn't something you can learn overnight. Uh, this takes education. This takes practice uh, and experience. So those skill sets um, are crucial to the electric, the future electrification of the UK to improve, whether it's the supply to our homes, the circuitry in our homes, the safety of those homes. But that there's a there's a there's an educational route there that is required. As a, as a homeowner, as a consumer prosumer, there's a different education is required. Um, now, that needs to be simplified for the homeowner. The thing is, a lot of the time, domestic consumer units or domestic energy centres in the future, they're hidden away in a cupboard. You know, there's some comments here about on, on online here about the meters, people being able to see the meters uh, before. You can have a look at dial spinning or a number changing. Yeah, but this is about education. Now you've got the new smart meters that are quite often maybe in your kitchen somewhere and you can see the dial, you can see the pounds, shilling and pence of what you're spending. It's about that education. It's an interest. Um, so I think there's there's two there's two two strings there. And technology from our members, when they're talking about the development of new technologies, the consumer, the prosumer is always at the forefront from safety primarily, but ease of use. You know, they want to be, it's, let's call it an old the plug and play technology. They want these things to be simple to use. There's another comment in the feed there about mobile phones. And, you know, Kieran touched on that. You know, I'm a geek and nerd as well. And I love a, I love a gadget and, and <laughs> another app to look at. You know, I've just, as I say, I've just got solar panels and I've got this new app on my phone that shows me where, what's being consumed. Oh, it's just fascinating. It's like, it's just, I can't stop looking at it. But that's just, <laughs> not everybody's into these, these applications. So that's, Development of hardware has to, you know, has to be considered going forwards to make it easier for. I'm not going to say it's a generational gap because it, it's not necessarily. But for those people that aren't smartphone enabled or want to be smartphone enabled, their technology in their homes has got to be safe and easy to use. Sure, Excellent. some very good answers there. And if I could just ask you one little follow up, if you say about potentially with the homeowner, the prosumer there's an education piece to be done. In a lot of the sessions we've had, the assumption has been that that kind of communication and education is to be done by manufacturers, often if it's around a single product. But if we're talking about a more joined up approach to the home rather than a simple product, guy, who do you see leading, who, who, whose job is it to lead on the education piece with the prosumer, do you think, Nick? Ooh, that's tough. Um, at the moment, where you've got manufacturers all have their own technologies, they've exactly. all got their own apps. Exactly. Um, so you might have an app for your solar, you might have an app for your heating system, you might have another app for your car, you know, all of those. Mm -hmm. you, you need some consistency from manufacturers, some, uh, some ways to tie all this technology together. Okay, in the background, their technology is being used. But you might be able to feed into a single app that's developed by, I don't know, might be DNO or someone like that. Um, Peter's got a... I think Peter's raising his finger yeah, there because we're, yeah. we're getting into an interesting kind of joined up thinking area. Peter, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on the, who might help? And I see Martin's waving as well. Peter. Yeah, um, for me, this is quite easy because uh, Bayes have uh, tasked the BSI and the BSI have come up with PAS 1878 and 1879, if my memory serves me correctly. And um, that's all about the IoT Internet of Things and getting all these devices to talk a common language mm -hmm. and um, how they will then report back to aggregators, et cetera, et cetera. And it's something that I've been pushing for um, with uh, the PLC and that getting all these different disparate devices to talk to a single entity that then goes back to an aggregator so you can uh, get paid for providing frequency response um, by national grid, et cetera, et cetera. So it is all tied together. 
um, with the PAS system. I just want to also go back to um, the skill sets that uh, Martin was talking about. By 2030, on, with the ban on the sale of ICE vehicles, that's going to create a million domestic charges a year. The government are then targeting 600,000 heat pumps a year. WPD covers from Lincolnshire to Pembroke to Cornwall. That's the middle third of Britain. That means our exposure, WPD's exposure, is going to be about half a million low carbon devices a year. That translates to 2,000 new connections a day. That is why we need the skill sets, because the guys at the sharp end, the plumbers, the electricians, they're going to be working because 2,000 connections a day, that's a big number. And that's just for WPD. Excellent. Martin, I don't know if I could bring you in there in terms of uh, uh, where you see this going. Yeah, I mean, I mean, some some great points coming out, and, and certainly when we're talking about you know safety uh, uh, and you know the, the products, the technology we're talking about now about connectivity, but we talk about sustainability, we talk about general safety. That cuts across three government policy leads. Mm. So there's you know there's, there's a conversation there. Which government department has got ultimate responsibility, <laughs> and are they talking to each other? Because you know we're having conversations in our product safety sort of world and. You know that we're talking to three government departments there and they're not always aligned in what they're saying and you've got you know that the, the, the opposite agenda is about benefiting from innovation so connected technology speed of innovation you know almost exponential against now an agenda to keep products in the market for much much longer and having them more repairable then they're sort of conflicting positions there and you know we need to make sure that safety again doesn't fall between the cracks i think one thing that really comes out and i think nick touched on it is education of the consumer is going to be critical to making sure that you know success yeah. all these sort of policies and uh, aspirations uh, are, are, are when, when they're coming out because you know the consumer is at the front end of everything so i educate the consumer well you know we're all busy people yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and you know there's only so much things people can can absorb there was a question coming out well what about those people who are not connected so you know predominantly the elderly generation of which is linked an increasing sort of uh, demographic but yeah we need to make sure that that everybody gets the the right information you know whether it's just information about what the technology is where to find an installer how to maintain it how to use it i mean we've even got the issue now where to save money you know energy prices are going going the wrong way and for many many years organizations like ourselves and the fire service have said don't use products at night or when you go out of the house Connected technology and trying to make yeah, yeah. use of demand side response and cheaper tariffs. That's exactly when some of these products will be will be used. You know, either by choice or the product itself might decide to come out at that time because sure. it thinks it knows best. So that's that's a change in messaging that's been around for many, many years. And I'm not saying there'll be more fires, but clearly a fire yeah. at night, you're less able to react. So we need to make sure that we don't have an increase in, in, in deaths through those events. So you know, there's, there's a heck of a lot here. And I suppose my, my sort of view is that there's no silver bullet solution to any of this. And, you know, collaboration, it's an overused term, but it is absolutely yeah. fundamental to, to the success of this massive challenge. You know, we touched on a few things here and, you know, we could go at it all day, really. Yeah. But the only way through this is to make sure organisations like we've got here on the panel just continue to talk to each other you know, because we all want the same thing. We just may have slightly different ways of, of getting, getting into it. I was going to put a question to Peter, actually, that we talk about three-phase tr uh, rollout. But uh, I've been talking to other people, and they talk about, well, DC distribution. That's that's the way forward. You know, again, mm -hmm. that's different. So, again, just to get, you know, it just shows the noise in this space. And how can we work together to navigate to make sure we don't waste uh, our, our efforts and make sure we get to the best solution? Well, Nice points about the need for collaboration and coordination, and I'm, uh, and also I know I called this the sort of um, future gazing crystal ball, rose tinted spectacles. But um, if you're mentioning the idea that government departments are going to speak to each other, that's pure fantasy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that's another level altogether. But uh, we're now we're now down. We're last into the last ten minutes now, and I do have 
I've got a quick one minute question for each of the panel to walk around just before we finish quickly. I'm going to start with you, Kieran. So uh, just imagine I could grant you one wish for legislative or regulatory change. If you could have, and this is not a, I know it's a political question, but put aside party politics for a moment. If you could have one piece of legislation or regulation that would incentivize or disincentivize the kind of changes you want. So one wish, Kieran, what would you ask for if you could have something that would be a game changer for you? I, I think we need to start off with the health, uh, with, the, with the safety and the, the health of the electrical system that we're going to start increasing on. So I would go for legislation for to improve the uh, electrical inspections because once you've got that baseline data you can then make informed decisions of what needs changing where your quick wins are and then start implementing uh, additional technologies to improve efficiency excellent you've possibly stolen martin's answer there we're going to come to peter because we do need to finish <laughs> on time so peter i'm giving you a, a quick minute and this is an actual minute as opposed to an engineer's minute which we know is something else <laughs> so if if i could grant you one wish in terms of a piece of legislation or regulation or something from central government that would change the game for you what would you ask them for today peter i agree with kieran it's actually about data because um, what we're finding there's a lot of installers that aren't notifying the host dno um, over the installation of low carbon tech and this is really making our job difficult in analyzing the network knowing where we've got a um, put bigger transformers, bigger cables, do whatever. And um, we did some work with Electrolink where we used 5% of the metering data in WPD and we found 20,000 LCTs that hadn't been notified right. just with 5% uh, of data. So for me, it's getting installation installs from installers to the host DNO so that we can make sensible decisions from there excellent to stop data being the wrong kind of four letter word martin uh, you've already kind of had your answer pinched but sorry you, mate. You, no you, no i'm gonna i'm gonna give that to key again so i won't repeat and waste my minute so i'm gonna go for uh recognition for online marketplaces to be recognized as a retailer in product safety legislation because many of the components oh, are and even equipment uh can be sold and purchased online so they, they need that needs to be tightened up. You know, online purchasing is, is clearly the way of the future, but it is a bit like the Wild West. So we need tighter legislation. So get marketplaces recognized as an actor in supply chain. That's a, that's a nice point. And then Nick, you've all, you already lost several of the answers here, I'm sure. But what would be, going, you're, you're, you're heading off, you've, you've got something under your arm, you're going to 10 Downing Street, and they're gonna grant you that wish. So when you get there, what are you asking for, Nick? Well, I've got to go with what we talked about with the mandatory inspections. I think right at the beginning of, of the webinar, Martin, sort of, it was akin to an MOT. We're all familiar with that. We know we have to do that. So why should it be any different for your home electrical installation? You know, it's critical to your, to the safety of that property and those adjacent and surrounding it. So I think that's a critical thing going forward. Excellent. Big call out there for to be made mandatory. So thank you very much. Big thank you to all our panelists, Martin, Peter, Kieran and Nick, plus, of course, our series partners at BEMA. To yourselves out there, virtual audience and Crowdcast for your comments, your stuff in the chat, your questions. A reminder to check out Elemental, elementalexpo.com, online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air and energy vital elements within the built environment. As I said at the top of the show, you'll find a full diary of events on the website, host of upcoming webinars, including one final session to come tomorrow in the Zero Carbon Home series with Beamer and it's on skills. So if that interests you, tune in again tomorrow, 11 a.m. that one. Plus, in case you missed it, there's a back catalogue of everything that's happened previously. It's all free, it's all on demand, and this session will be available almost as soon as we close the window for you either to re-watch or to share with colleagues, friends, family, but suppliers, customers, clients, anybody you think you'd benefit from having a listen to what's been said. So thank you once again to my panel. That's it for today. I've been Jim McClelland, editor at Susmeen. Thanks for watching. See you all again soon. Cheers. Thank Cheers. You. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye -bye.